There you go. Hello, we can hear you. Okay. And then is someone typing in the chat? Yeah, see. we were like answering the questions you just said. Oh, tippity typity. There it is. Yeah, it's like for whatever is. reason behind. Oh. What the? All right, whatever. It's working now. <laughs> oh, All right. All right, I'm going to read through Esteban's questions. And answer them thoroughly. But before I do, I'm going to drink some water. Okay. Tips on pushing rendering. The way I understand it is <clears throat> the way that I understand it, it's basically clarifying elements like piece of metal, but now with cut lines, bolts, and rust, etc. Shirt, but with shoulder seams and visible stitching. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll, I'll answer that by actually demonstrating it. Good books on learning design specifically. Heard of picture this, uh, but curious about character specific stuff. Um, books. I mean, there's like, there's a lot. Uh, Design Studio Press has a lot of good books, but ultimately, the best books on learning design for characters, you can probably find them in like the Marvel catalog. Um, the Skillful Huntsman is another good book. <laughs> Um, but in general, there's a lot of just good videos. You don't even need to get a book. You can just like watch a couple of videos, talks about design. Um, and the big picture ideas that you need to learn about design is what I like to think of as the Boba Fett versus the Darth Vader. So Boba Fett is cool because he looks cool. Darth Vader is cool because he is cool. And those are kind of like the large view of character design. But ultimately, it's all about shapes and patterning. And that you can learn from like any kind of just design book in general, uh, even including, even including, you know, graphic design books. Anyway, uh, what does your study regiment look like right now mixed with work? Uh, I, if I work, I work. Uh, I've already practiced and put the training in for that kind of stuff. But if I really need to study something new or learn something new, then I just gather lots of reference and look at it and research it. Uh, how do contracts work? It seems like um, Felice had a very similar question, so I'll answer that during hers. What's a good file image f uh, size for file renders? Uh, pretty large. I usually go no smaller than like an eight and a half by 11. So like 3,000 by 2,000 pixels, but I, I sometimes go even larger. Yeah, so this is too small. Yeah, something where you can get really detail-oriented if you wanted to. And I'll show you the rendering and then I'll talk about the studying because I'm actually currently studying stuff too. So rendering uh, is just, yeah, it's just clarifying the elements even more. So, so for instance, if I had designed this character, You know, all the stuff you're seeing now is just the basic rendering of a character, uh, at least in the intro level, just like getting the character established. You know, stuff that you've kind of already done already, just getting the values in. There you go. And so then once you get kind of once you get kind of get a 
a place where you start to kind of clarify some basic shapes and forms. Then it's just about really refining. So uh, before I even get started, I usually make sure I have like an imprint that makes sense because right now there's still parts of this that I don't think are looking good. And so until I feel like that's looking good, then I don't even get started rendering. And what I mean by imprint, I just mean like when I look at it, it already feels done. And it's just a matter of actually making it done. Now let's give this guy a neck. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> All right, <clears throat> so I'll give him something on his shoulders too so we can render a different material. Okay, this works. So once I start to have what I believe is enough to kind of get started to really render, uh, then I will do it, but uh, I'm still kind of just going for it because I don't feel like that's there yet. But typically what I try to do is, is solve a lot of the big problems right away, like right, right now. Like what is the shapes? What is the shadow shapes? These types of things. And really try to get to that level of like clarity that I can see. It doesn't matter if I think it's clear for somebody else. It's important that it's clear for me. And if it's not clear for me, then it's it's going to be really hard to refinish it. And if you have a hard time seeing even if it's good for you to work from, this is why you have to do more finished paintings so you can know your limits because you've tested them often. See, for me, like this, this is working out all right. All right. And it's at a point where I'm like, okay, you know what? I think I see everything. And it's specifically this brush that's making it a little bit more of a challenge. That's why it's taking me longer than normal. But like, but then what I'll do then is like use a brush that I feel way more comfortable with. And I'll zoom in just a little bit. And now I'll start to kind of get in some of these larger features, smoothed out like right away. So I'll start to like look at the larger shape of this person's head and start to kind of uh, soften edges that are a little too hard and get rid of the texture that doesn't need to be there. And this is important because it doesn't mean get rid of all textures, it just means to get rid of the texture that does not need to be there. Some texture is fine, even if it's not like super refined from this vantage point that I'm looking at right now, it looks good. And if that's true, then I'll just keep it there. Um, start to construct better anatomy in the nose because I can see the placement of, of these features. And I'm going to do like that dynamic lighting I kind of did earlier because um, that also helps with presentation. But see, there are some major structural problems that I couldn't necessarily get in, but I can do it now. But this goes back to like, I know that I'm capable of doing it because I've done it before. So me trying to do it with that other brush was just me just trying to see if I can do it, but clearly it was not happening. So kind of like just stopped. And now I'm just like clarifying a lot of these forms. And then going really fine with the brush. So some of these shapes can be sculpted in accurately.
There you go. And I just keep doing this until it looks done, until it looks really, really done. Um, and then there's like the T Sherry. So I zoom in one more, one more level. So we're adding like every little hair strand. I like the eyelashes. Maybe like clarify like where the eyelid is, the bottom eyelid, and the tear duct. But I try not to get too close because sometimes I still don't see it properly. Like I'd rather try to like solve those details even at this distance. And I wouldn't go any closer than we just saw because at that point it's like, um, that's like if I'm trying to really get like photorealistic with the textures, but I'm not all about that. I'm not that detail oriented, at least not with paintings. I think there's still an element of charm having a painting have some sort of quality that's not so refined, but I think refinement is still very, pretty valuable. But that's like, that's more like pandering to other artists when I go at that level. It's not necessarily important. And in terms of other materials, it's the same implied thing. I try to get everything all smoothed out, making sense. And then I'll start to put in any kind of reflection. If this is like a little bit more metallic or super shiny, but then I'll start to smooth it out. Broad strokes and then sharp angles. And I like to paint in my textures <clears throat> because when you paint in everything, it just makes it more, uh, it just makes it more um, consistent feeling. As soon as you add in like photo texture elements, then everything needs to look photo textured. It just, you can't just get away with it being, um, like some parts are painterly and other parts, it just, it looks off the balance. But I can tell that that would take more time. So I, again, I don't necessarily do too much detail. And sometimes I use brushes of my own <clears throat> to help push those types of things. Maybe this is like a matte material here. And then we can add some stitching. And again, I think about the implied line there. If it doesn't have to be super rendered, like detailed, like those stitches, then I won't do it. Because if, if, especially like if my character, this is just a portrait, but like if I'm like zoomed out, like the question is, does that look, does that look like it's refined? Like, could I tell what that is if I'm just looking at it as a, at a glance? But anywho, that's how I go about rendering. I just keep fidgeting, fidgeting until it starts to come together. This to me is probably like a good 75%, but ultimately, hopefully it answers your question. <clears throat> All right. And studying, um, yeah, let me show you that process. And I, I just read what you wrote about your father. It's all good, dude. I can still answer your questions about getting into it. So I just like find images that I try to get better at. So I've been getting back into 3D sculpting. I want to kind of tell my own stories, do these like short, really short stories of 
my own designs and sculpts. And so I'm going to just start doing it. Like start sculpting cool and interesting characters. So I've gathered like lots of reference and stuff like this. So I've been like practicing in ZBrush because I like I love ZBrush, especially for organic sculpting. But I love uh, 3D code for everything else. <laughs> And so I'm kind of like thinking like, maybe I should just learn how to do a lot of this stuff in 3D code. I've seen people do these types of things in 3D code. So what I would probably do, oh, this is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool character. Let me open this up. Yeah, most certainly this was done in ZBrush though, most of these. Because 3D code's still kind of like um, underdog in the, all this. Only the real masters get it. I love this guy's stuff. So anyway, um, do I have pure ref? I don't remember. I do, nice. Okay, there you go. Okay, so I'll take an image. So right now it's just a matter of like, can I, um, control shift A. Okay, so then I open up 3D code. <clears throat> I'm trying to, <laughs> I forget how to, to do this. Control T, Control Shift T. How do I, how do I, I should have read it before I did it. Let me close it, open it again. You can open the settings if you just go like on your bar, on the Windows bar. Quiet woman. And then <laughs> wow! <laughs> just kidding. It's like I'm talking to my father. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, where is it? The settings? Uh, like, yeah, exactly there. And usually, if you no, no, if you if you right click what? on it, the settings should. Yeah, wait. If you right click on it, you lied to me. Damn it! I'll just read. It. Okay. Just or read you can just fine. restart. Yeah, you say yeah, right right click on here. That's the only options I got, by the way. Yeah. It's weird. So you're wrong. Feels bad. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> okay, it's fine. You can continue now. Yeah, I um, I rarely use this, but for studying, it's perfect. <clears throat> because usually, for for me, I'll put everything on a second monitor, and I or I'll just have it behind my Photoshop, and I'll just glance at it. Especially if I'm just trying to be creative, I don't want to actually be seeing um my thing at all times <clears throat> but transparent to mouse this on top um but anyway yeah it's just um for studying it's like perfect i need it like i like to have something right in front of me the whole time overlay selection is is control y that's what it was yeah okay that's what I really wanted. I didn't really care much for. And then what I can do here is put on like the other reference. So like this, maybe even going to the source, the high res version. What, I thought I already liked this person. 3D concepts, there you go. Drag this drop in there. Yeah, this person has a lot of the kind of stuff that I love. This person clearly needs more likes. Um, yeah, I love this type of stuff. Looks like Warframe. Just kidding. 
I mean, I think this actually might be four Warframe. <laughs> yeah, so maybe maybe it's more than looks like. Maybe he actually works on the their project. But like stuff like this, man, I love it. Anyway, let's let's add it in here for a good reference. But really, I want to get my forms looking solid, like that image right there. This is more for creative adventures. But I really care only about this image. This one's fine, actually. I don't think I need that one. I'll just like this and come back to it later. Anyway, so so for studying, I'm gonna do 3D code, but it's it's the same it's the same thing where you're about to see here. Okay. And what I mean by this is um like it's the same principled idea, which is that, you know, when I study, I like will do or use images that are helpful to me at that moment. Like I will like look at this image and then try to, um, you know, <clears throat> design from it. Like I'll be like, okay. Like if I'm trying to learn how to sculpt like a face like that, what can I do? I know I, I know how I'd go about this in 3D code. I'm sorry, uh, ZBrush, but not so much 3D code. So this is going to be interesting. I don't think I've ever done a study like this in 3D code. I think I've just used 3D code proactively as a tool for work, like immediately. <clears throat> so. Now I know that the pinch tool is not, not the kind of pinch tool that I like. Um, but I'm gonna try to see if I can do it. So I'm gonna use the pinch tool to kind of sculpt some of these forms. But I'm like learning how it's behaving and I'm expecting a different result because I've used uh, ZBrush. And so this is something that I always know that I have to be careful of whenever using uh, software is not to expect the same results. This is like a, the number one problem that I see a lot of um, a lot of people who use. Yeah, so I know for sorry, I'm like thinking out loud. Like this is why I don't show me studying a lot because I don't necessarily, I can't do what I normally would be able to do, which is talk and, and like, like talk and explain while I'm doing it because that's the whole point. Like when I'm studying, I'm not really, I'm, I'm so focused on what I'm trying to learn. Like I can't just like do this and talk over it. And so, so for instance, for me, like I'm thinking about like how it's behaving, what I can try differently. And I already have a strategy that I want to try to do. So this is this is already me like not doing that strategy. So what I would probably do something like, I think the strategy is with voxel sculpting, I just need to like get in like the pieces and just stop worrying about whether I get like the exact detail um, right away because I can do that in the surface mode. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get like the macro level stuff. Let's see if I can do it from here. Yeah, so this works. You know, because I've seen people do some really good sculpts in 3D coat, so clear it's clear to me that it's not 3D coat. It's just like my own biases and my own um, thought processes that are getting in the way. But but the fact that I'm so legacy at uh, ZBrush, it does get in the way of me wanting to learn new software, even if like I think ultimately it's going to be better. Like same thing, uh, it's the same way I feel about like learning Blender. Like I already have a really good way of getting stuff done without Blender. 
you know, so it's like, I don't really necessarily need I don't really need to do a, um, or learn a new software. But again, as I'm studying, I'm just using that reference as a guide of like what I'm gonna try to create. And then now I'm like, all right, let me put to practice what I was talking about. Let me see if I can actually, let me close this. <clears throat> let me see if I can actually create something that's a little bit more a little bit more closer to that reference and see how I'll do it. So now that I'm in surface mode, I'm gonna remove stretching, great. Do build up, yeah. Yeah, so this is more a line of what I would be expecting. Okay, and then let's just do a depth of 35. Okay, cool. Okay, so now how would I create that same thing? So maybe I'll do something like this. And then I'll just like, okay, I'll build it up here. And then I have a pinch tool and this pinch tool reacts more like what I would expect. And then I'm just gonna get like a lot more of these wrinkles. I think proportionally this is off. And I went, I cut that real deep. But I'm already like, okay, I can see what I can do differently uh, next time around. So for instance, one of the, the things that I think I could have done differently was not try to sculpt the head so perfect in the voxel mold, just like get the proportions, like the relative proportions, right? In voxel, mo voxel mode. And then, and then worry about this stuff. Yeah, because surface sculpting in here, the value of doing it here instead of in ZBrush is that uh, unlike ZBrush, this actually has a proper like materials, you know? And that's like super, super dope for obvious reasons. Right, because I can change this guy to gold, you know, and get a good sense of what he actually is gonna look like with these different features. Because normally when you're in ZBrush, you're making something that's like, with like one of these types of materials. Do I have another? Why don't I have two of my mats? Let's go back to default. Something that's like less um, less cavity driven, like something like this, except a little bit more contrast even too. Where this is really nice because you can kind of see how the cavities are being affected. But what's cool is that even though um, we get a sense of like how the cavities will be affected, we can also um, rely on this is what's gonna look like when we render it out in, in the paint room. So when we paint from it, it's gonna be dope. There's a couple things that ZBrush does really well that uh, this doesn't like, which is the masking. But I think again, it's more of just my, intu my intuition. I'm just used to it a certain way. And so maybe I can just like divorce myself from this mentality by just sculpting more and more organic stuff in here. I mean, this is just, this is me just free thinking like what I'm actually learning. Like that's how I think I say, oh, you know, maybe if I did this, like, or if I approach it this way, but this is how I did all my paintings too. Like this is how I got better at painting. I just would come up with a thing. And you can see like, this is not good at all. <laughs> like compared to like what I can actually do like in ZBrush, I can sculpt really well um, because of years of practice, but <clears throat> and especially I can paint something even cooler, you know? But this is not me trying to make anything good right out of the gate. This is me trying to like learn the tool a little bit better. And so I've already kind of felt like, okay, I've learned quite a bit from this. Whoops. 
And like, let me show you the cool stuff that you can get out of 3D code. Like the split tool, for instance, is like unlike anything else I've ever dealt with. If it doesn't crash on us. Uh, I might crash. And if it does, it's kind of for the best, so I can start a new sculpt real fast. Oh no, it oh I know why it was doing that in the first place too. Because um it's not voxel anymore. But you can do this. Now you have a separate thing. You can like change its material. And it's really it's really simple. And it's really nice. And I can go in here and do some cool stuff like this. Get these perfect cuts. Cut like directly through it like that. Reliably. You know, so I think like for making hard surface stuff, this is like bar none. Nothing really competes with 3D coats, hard surface sculpting. Yeah, look at that, it's super great. But then the organic stuff, I'm still struggling with. You know? Like this is what I sculpted. Um, in ZBrush, and it looks cool already. So there is our, always the option of just like, cause even with just like that really plain um, material still looks really good. Cause ZBrush has a lot of really good organic sculpting tools. That looks really cool too. That looks dope. We can put it into this lighting situation too. It's gonna look cool. You know what I'm getting at? <clears throat> so it's a matter of just like sculpting more and so let's try again let me let me try something different this time so i'm going to go to voxel and i'm going to essentially just do the same thing but i'm going to like focus on large planar stuff and i'm going to do some cool stuff too where it's like I'm just going to get real like atelier type style. And then you can do some stuff like Vox Hide. So I can do and then I can kind of bring back The nose a little bit and then cut it off the nose again. And then maybe shave off some of these side planes to kind of create this more geometric looking dude. But see, this is something that is like really hard to do in ZBrush unless you sculpt it in. And so this was like one of the other things I considered is that maybe I should just get really good at sculpting, like in general, like even hard surface stuff in ZBrush. So now let's go ahead and smooth out some of these forms and then let's, let's imply some Let's imply some more anatomy. This is not my intention. It looks like an old man. It's not what I'm intending to happen, but it's what's happening. But I'm already kind of convinced even like starting at like a more planar level like this, it's actually pretty effective. I 
Okay, let's bring it to the surface. <clears throat> but this is how I study. Just with sculpting instead of uh, And so a painting, but it's the same principled idea. And it's not as exciting because like, I'm not like talking through it every second, getting into my motivational speeches. <laughs> it's because when I, when I study, I don't think of anything other than what I'm actually learning. Oh, well, that's really cool. That turned out actually pretty dope. There's these, um, yeah, this is actually not a bad idea. There's these, these types of, um, sculptures i'll show you guys that i want to kind of do because I, I think it's like right in my alleyway like of like it's low-hanging fruit for me aesthetically but it's also let's like increase the resolution here see if that helps let's bring this back to and then let's increase it to like a really hefty amount. So there is <clears throat> there is this type of image right here that I really like. It's like the right kind of tonal texture that I like, stuff like this. Super cool. I don't know why I didn't say this. You know, just like sculptures that can exist. And a little bit more challenging than your average bear. Stuff like this too is pretty cool. This is a real sculpture though. Spiderly. But like um, sculpting this kind of stuff would be a lot of fun. So, okay, so now that we've done that, so we should have a lot more. You see, I'm learning, like I just realized that maybe if I do this, I can have, yeah, see this is tight. Then I have a lot more um, density. I could probably go even more dense, but then that's now I have to challenge what that might be. But this is essentially how I study. This is so cool. This is actually pretty fun. I think I might have found uh, somewhat of a process. I didn't mean to sculpt this old man though. <laughs> so that's that's kind of a problem. But I do like, oh yeah, I should look into, there's the freeze. I think there's a way to do it. Um, let's see. So the freeze, um, my fill clay, build up clay. No, there's a, a tool here where it's pretty much like the masking tool, but they, they call it freeze and it works essentially the same, but I don't see it here. Whatever. I know it's it's available somewhere. I just gotta look for it. Oh, right here. I just wasn't looking. Yeah. But even this freeze is like it's not as as good as the masking tool in uh ZBrush. But like again, it could just be a matter of just learning the tool here better or learning how to do it in, in ZBrush. Both are clearly options available to me. I just got to just decide. Uh, and there's nothing, um, dang it. Yeah, and there's nothing, there's nothing stopping me. Oh, what the heck happened there? Look at that. It's tight. <laughs> Happy accidents. Yeah, this, that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> I might just need to like really learn 
um, 3D coat. Yeah, because this is turning out great. This is turning out exactly as I wanted, except for the old man idea. But again, I won't get too much into this, but there's like, there is the final stage of what this will look like, like how I want it to look at the end. And I don't like that I go to ZBrush, then to here, and then like render it all out. Like I like this continuous feeling of control over my painting and design. I did it for this chick right here. I'll show you. Where I had like a consistent flow of control. I think I actually just posted recently. Yeah. But like this, this actual character uh, model. Like let me see if I can find the model. But I sculpted her almost entirely. It's like 90%, um, 95% sculpted in ZBrush. I think I might have passed it. And then threw it into 3D code, did all stuff. But I, I discovered there was like some problems along the way. But this was all, she was all sculpted in ZBrush. And the problems that I discovered was just like a lot of that detail get lo got lost once you saw it rendered. And so I had to like sculpt in some more features in the, in the final, but there was still those subtle pieces were still there, you know? Like there was still a lot of like what I originally, but you can see it's all a little bit softer than I was hoping, you know, especially in the horns. But it turned out, it turned out all right. I just did not expect it to be as soft as it was. So I had to like rely on painting a lot. And so I kind of want to like be in a world where I understand what it's going to look like from the start to finish because I would have sculpted it that way. Like see like all these little noise and detail in her face that was like painted in, I think. And so it would have just been nice if I would have had that from the start. I don't like not knowing how the end result's gonna be. Like when you're sculpting in ZBrush, it feels good, but then when you bring into different stuff where it feels different, like I don't like that process. So it's like, I better, either I get really, really good at sculpting in ZBrush or I get more effective using 3D code uh, and finding what that balance is. But I mean, I, it seems to me I can still do 3D code. But like, here's like an example of like a sculpt that I did in 3D code. You could tell like there's a huge difference in quality, right? But this was more of like a demo anyway. I don't think I was really trying to make something super epic. But even then, I think I was learning some stuff about what I could have done differently. But like, I can get way more fascinating with the design with this. It seems like people react more positively to this design too than like this more high quality. Like the design here is cool. The quality here is better. And so it seems to me that like if I could just bring the high quality here, then GG, right? But that's what I'm saying. Like that's how I study. I just like observe what I could have done differently, what's missing, what's problematic, what I have to practice. And I give myself these little mini missions. So I guess like the next mission is just like to make something that looks so incredible in a 3D coat. Like I don't need ZBrush kind of approach. Uh, and then once I've gotten there, then I think, I think I'll be good. And I think it's really just a matter of, I'm just so used to 3D or ZBrush because I've been using it since its inception. I just need to create a process that makes sense. I think the sculpting ahead of time works really well. And I even like have a, even a better strategy, I think that might require like using 3D tools. Yeah, look at that, that looks great already. I mean, it's like a really bad design, but like in terms of quality for the time that I spent on it, it's, it's actually pretty impressive. Right, it already looks kind of real. <clears throat> I just need, there's also another factor that I, I'm considering is just that I just might need to be a better sculptor. Might not be a good sculptor in general. <laughs> like I'm decent, but not great. Clearly a better painter. Um, and then what was another question that we had? Contracts, I think. Yeah, what's a good file? Yeah, so the contracts thing. And that's going to Felice's. She, so I'm going to answer your stuff, your questions now, Felice. 
Uh, my dream job is to design novel covers and characters. I'm fortunate enough to go to Japan a couple of times and the cover designs are all a different level than here in the US. See images on Skype. Yeah, I saw those already. Um, how can I create a job that doesn't really exist? <laughs> well, if there's no job that exists, like if you're trying to do something very specific, like, and you don't know what that world is, then you might have to just build your own brand, right? But if, you, um, if you're pointing out to those images, then you've got to just draw images at that level. Like if you're saying you want to do stuff like that. You know what I mean? Oh, did Felice leave already? No, she's still here. Okay, great. Um, right, if you're building a, a portfolio of like images that, um, like of like a process that doesn't exist, then yeah, that's just kind of that's not a, a smart strategy, because uh, like or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. If you are building a portfolio around a like industry that doesn't that doesn't exist, then yeah, you're you 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 won't get a job right you have to think practically that that's clear like that's not a good idea in the long term okay but if you don't really care to work you just want to make money and do what you like then you got to build an audience for what you do online and luckily for you there's lots of people in the world and there's lots of people online and what that means for you then is that you just need to find those people who also like what you like, you know what I mean? And build a, a, a really meaningful portfolio around that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you, you just uh, build a portfolio around your, your respected genre of art. Uh, otherwise, yeah, just don't be shocked that you can't get work. Like, so if you want to like build like some sort of obscure storyline that just is like, completely wild and not expected and and people are going to think that it's like really bonkers but you love it you know it's like the cyber truck stuff that elon musk has done like it's it's cool but it's like practically nobody there's no market for that vehicle that's large enough to justify the cost um but but the more i found out about it the more i started thinking no it might actually be okay because um, the cost of the, the vehicle isn't that expensive to make, right? And so if it's not a, that expensive to make and they sell it for the price point that they're selling it for, they actually might make their money back uh, and actually make a profit. Um, so it's, it's not that it's, a, it's a, a, a very large market vehicle. It just might be like enough, like, Elon Musk has just probably designed a vehicle that he knows is going to sell enough. And if it sells enough, then it doesn't matter how it looks, you know? And that's a great example of building an obscure design that only appeals to a very small pandering group of people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if you, if you're trying to build portfolios that are just like, that are just so clearly there's nobody who wants that kind of stuff, then yeah, man, don't be surprised. You're not going to get work. Um, but if you are building a portfolio that is clear, like there is an audience for it and there is a genre of work to be made from that aesthetic, like the kind of covers you just sent earlier. And like there's plenty of examples of covers, arts and stuff like that. Then you just got to build more cover art in uh, images obviously right because you need people to know that that you can you're capable of doing it and you have to have evidence of this and so so this is why i would recommend yeah of course build a portfolio around um what you think you're capable of building absolutely um what one thing about the rates and stuff usually i just suggest building a uh a rate that you think you're valued so if you think you are um, $30 an hour, which I usually recommend for people who are starting out, but I actually recommend even higher now. I think you can probably ask, be asking people for more than that. You probably ask some somewhere along the lines of, um, 
um, like forty dollars an hour, thirty-five to forty dollars an hour. I think is a really good starting place for a artist. You know, but as you start to become more and more established, you should ask for more and more money. If you get hired by big companies, you should clearly be asking for a lot more money. But um, one thing that I would suggest is, yeah, pick an hourly rate that you feel comfortable with, you know? And once you've found whatever that is, like whatever that rate is, then you just prorate that to everything else. So for instance, let's say a company wants to hire you and you want to work for them. Um, and they're like, we only work with flat, flat rates. So then you just come up with a flat rate that makes sense. Right? So if you say you want to work for, you know, I don't know, um, like a, a flat rate of $500 and your rate is, let's make it sim really simple, $50 an hour, then you can only work 10 hours on that project. You understand? So if they ask for you to do more, right? Like if they ask you to do more work, um, and it's going to expand past the, what you call it? The, the five hour mark or is it 10 hour mark? Then you got to just ask for more money and just be very explicit that that's the case. Um, because if they start to just take you for whatever you like $500 and then you just say, yeah, I can do it. And you just do whatever that may be like, like let's say a hundred hours of work, you know, now you're getting paid like $5 an hour. You know what I mean? Like you're getting paid way less than you would if you just went and applied to work at McDonald's or something. And so you always got to keep that in mind. You want, you want to get paid more than your average, you know, person who can just apply to any kind of job anywhere, you know, because what we do is still hard. Even like, you know, uh, at the level that you're doing them, then you might not feel like, well, they're not like high quality, like some of these really badasses. Uh, that's fine, but you don't have to be like at that level. You know what I mean? Makes sense. But that's usually how I, I charge. I charge based off of um, flat rates and or a, a sorry a flat cost of what my hours are worth so nowadays i charge like me specifically i charge roughly between 125 to 200 dollars an hour it depends on who i'm working with but minimum 125 nothing lower than that uh but then i will i will do daily rates for projects that are really big or much larger i usually charge a daily rate my daily rate is between uh, seven fifty to a thousand dollars an hour, or sorry, thousand dollars a day. And I can ask for this type of stuff because the clients I hi get hire me, you know, they um, what you call it, they they want me to do that kind of stuff. You know, they want me to do whatever they need me to do. I'm thinking of asking for even more because I I do a lot of really good. Uh, fast work for some of these people so it's like I'm starting to it's starting to affect my livelihood and so I need to like get better about that like by asking for more money but hope that helps Uh, your last question, thousand dollars an hour. Um, I might need to leave something. My last question is, can you be a reference, like write a recommendation letter? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And to Zach's thing about like, yeah, the same principle of like learning the software better, like that applies to all software, like obviously. So for instance, like I use mobile tools a lot too. And, you know, I use uh, Procreate and I use Infinite Painter. And so it's like, I learn how to use these tools and I try not to think of them as Photoshop, Light or whatever. I think of them as individuals. And when you start to think in this way, it just makes your life so much simpler. 
people tend to like compare and expect, but it's like, no, nah, like just use the tool and try to understand its philosophy to be able to make a better tool, you know, or to, to get a better painting out of the tool. If you expect uh, certain things from a certain tool and it doesn't produce those results, then yeah, you're gonna, you always feel disappointed. It's like being in a relationship and you're expecting somebody to like make you happy with all the things that go on in your life. Like that's just not going to work out. Yeah, clearly a better, uh, better painter because <laughs> I spent so much more time. I, th I think there's a really cool idea here that I never thought about was making the underlying layers mode from the start like this. Because what's cool about it is I, I can like paint in lighting without affecting my shadows too much. And then I can go in here. It's just so uh, it's so staggering of a process. Like it, it feels like I'm really halting my painting effect. But like, there's a lot of things that are happening that are so promising. Like I don't have to go back and fix. It's like a really great way of like not having too many different layers, but it still feels like you're painting on one layer. Here's another cool strategy. I can do this so it doesn't affect my highest, my highest lights as well. So what I can do here is essentially add in some sort of bounce light. Okay. Or, or not bounce light, but like um, uh, trim light, a rim light. I'm sorry, I don't know why I call it trim light. And then, if I wanted to add like a darker shadow, like right behind this, normally I would have to paint it through. But now I can just kind of like paint it without it being affected at all. But I don't even like what I did. My trim, my rim. So we can go back in time to when that didn't exist. I think that's as far back as I can go. Anyway, any other questions? Oh, uh, you can, I feel like I've been just talking to myself. Can you please, Samia, use your voice? Yes. <laughs> I will save you with my voice. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's kind of a stupid question again, but I've been really struggling with getting off my anime and stylization um, art. Uh -huh. So whenever I find myself doing some kind of studies, it's always in a way comic-ish so i really struggle with doing things realistically and i don't know why it's like but do you want it to be more realistic or do you want it to be more stylized kind of semi-realistic to be honest um so yeah in a way i thought or i still have this advice stuck with me that you should learn realistic first and blah 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 and uh, i partly do want to do that um but yeah yeah, so um, I think it's okay to, to, to do both, like stylized practicing and realistic practicing. The question that you have to answer yourself is what do you really want to do? And then find examples of that and then just copy it. Like straight okay. copy that style for a little bit. Like look at the images and like literally just like copy verbatim. And the whole point you're doing this is not to learn anything entirely, but just start to kind of get your hand 
to practice these these types of movements okay Mm, and then and then when you once you've done that then i would say like you know start to understand the logic behind why it's happening um you know i made a video a long time ago it's one of my most popular ones where i talk about how to study and okay and in that video i talk about like there's copying and there's study and in that video i want to kind of make some clarifications that i didn't in the video which is that that like when I say study, uh, I'm saying you're, you're doing something to try to learn, right? You're doing something so you can mm-hmm. learn and copying isn't studying, okay? Yeah. And when people heard that, I think what ended up happening is people just don't copy at all. And mm-hmm. I think the, the problem that I didn't address within that video in the context of what I'm talking about now is that there's nothing wrong with copying. In fact, copying is part of studying. But when people think that they've copied something, that they've learned something, they don't understand what the the value of copying is. Copying allows you to have a better control of your tools. It helps you start to get a better hand movement. Like it gets you better draftsmanship, right? Mm -hmm. It's like solving a puzzle when you're like copying another person's image and seeing where all the puzzle pieces go. But it doesn't tell you how the puzzle pieces go there. It doesn't tell you why the puzzle pieces go there. You know, it just mm-hmm. tells you like, this is how you mix colors. This is how you put these shapes together. You understand? Yeah. But you don't know why and you can't replicate it usually. Right? Because you, you'll need reference. You've been studying yeah. just the movements. I'm sorry, you're practicing just the movements. But whenever people are having this hard time of like breaking out from a specific way of sculpting or designing or whatever, the way to get out of this, at least um, for me, and what I've seen mm-hmm. my students do, is to copy, like just straight up copy somebody's like mastered work, so you can like be in their shoes for just a second, so you can see how those shapes come together, mm-hmm. like, but with your hand, because it's still not easy to copy an image, right? Yeah. Like nobody can just grab like a Photoshop <laughs> tool equivalent and just start making replicas of anything, right? That's still a skill in itself clearly yeah but the skill that people think that they're getting from that is misguided sometimes that's why you have to have a have a real understanding what it means when you do that because when like i said when people don't do that right when Mm -hmm. people think that they know what they're learning and then they go to apply it and then they're like how come nothing that i did stuck this is where that that point of study don't copy comes into place Mm. but i'm telling you this because i wasn't sure if you watched the video uh, and it seems like you haven't, which is good. So now you have this better context of what I meant. Yeah. Is yeah, it on your gun road or do you have a... It's free. It's just on have... YouTube. Yeah. What? If you just type in Anthony Jones YouTube. And maybe like specifically how to study Anthony Jones, you may find it faster even. Oh, I just typed YouTube in the YouTube search bar. Okay. <laughs> you typed in YouTube in the YouTube search bar. Yes. Cool. cool. I feel like my mom. <laughs> it's like YouTube. whenever she wants to visit a site, she goes to YouTube and she tells me I, I didn't find it. She doesn't understand the difference between Google and YouTube. That's funny. Yeah. Mothers yeah. are precious. Yeah. So do you get uh, you get my point though? Absolutely. Between yeah. studying and copying. Copying is a part of studying. It's, a, it's another way of practicing. Mm. It's not um, <clears throat> It's not a bad tool to practice with. Uh, it's just that when people don't understand, like uh, when you practice painting your forms, mm. that's another form of practicing and, and that is not to necessarily get really good with your tool or learn how to move pixels together. That yeah. is so you have a better grasp of how form works. True. Right? Like you're still getting a little bit of control over how you're using your brushes and all that stuff, but you're mostly focused on you're mo- mostly focused on this other thing. You know, like mm-hmm. just this one principled idea. And I think that's the thing that um I usually want my students to walk away from when I tell them to study versus to just um copy but yeah copying has its place but not where people think it it belongs 
right. Yeah, but like, yeah, copying uh, uh, someone else's style, um, especially in the context of just learning, it's fine. Uh, in fact, usually what I'll do is um, to make sure that I don't really feel any, any kind of genuine weirdness because I could see how people would feel weird if you just copied. Mm. Uh, I don't post those stuff. I just sh keep it to myself. Yeah. Because it's not really for me to share anyway. I'm just trying to learn from this person. And what I did is an image that is an exact replica of somebody else's image. Now, uh, I know people who do this and they share it anyway. I don't think there's anything mm. wrong with it. I think personally I don't because I don't think that's the goal of what I was trying to do was to show people how much I've learned. Yeah. I want to show people how much I've learned in the context of actual work that I do. Mm. Not through like these fake uh, these fake sense this fake sense of accomplishment. Cause it is an accomplishment, but it's not it doesn't then mean that I can now paint really good without looking at reference. This is, that would be a lie. It just means that at the time when mm. I was looking at this reference, I was totally able to replicate it. Uh, but that's only from my own knowledge and nobody else needs to know what I learned from there um, until I've put together a final image. So you guys saw me do like that 3D sculpt and I didn't save it, I just kind of like abandoned it. Um, yeah. I'll do a lot more. I'll do a lot more of those types of things and abandon a lot more of them. And then eventually say, you know what? Um, I'm going to now try to make a good image. You know? Mm. I'm going to now try to make an image that I would consider done. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> and then share that. Make sense? Absolutely. And then see how people react to that. Because that, that is, would be more honest. And if people react negatively to it, most people don't. They usually just won't like it as much. But mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great way for me to get an insight on it. Like, okay, people didn't react to that very well. Um, so let me try something else. Let me practice some more or whatever. And then I'll share another image. And then maybe more people react to that. Maybe less. It's all right. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I'm always doing what I like. I'm just sharing it and seeing what other people like about what I like. And then when something sticks, usually it's like I like it as well. Like I like what may have happened. And I'm happy to see that everyone else also like really liked it too. And then I kind of go full, full on in that. Right. Like, so I'm putting together a comic book. Uh, recently I've been working on it with a friend of mine. Huh. And so, okay. so I'm doing like this more like painterly approaches and trying to find what works best for me. Uh, the one that makes me feel the most comfortable, but also gets uh, a strong reaction. And so I'm constantly been testing it, testing the waters a bit. But anyway, that's how I go about doing it. Cool. All right. Yeah, I don't make any assumptions that whatever I think is good is actually good. Um, I only do things that I like, and if other people like it, then I'll keep doing it. All right. Cool beans. Any other questions? Uh, I'm wondering, my buddy keeps telling me to start up a Patreon, but I haven't established like any online presence really. I have like a couple sketches on a, on an Instagram. Yeah. Who, who's your buddy? Why are they uh, giving you this advice? I mean, he's just uh, a friend who, uh, I mean, is I he an artist? Yeah, he's done some texture work for Bioware, but like overall he's not, he's not like super into it. But yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> like, he's just, garbage. He's a garbage person. I don't even know why I'm friends with him. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's a great guy. Uh, I'm just saying, like, I don't know. I, I'm just yeah, bad you should. At... No. Yeah, and I'll explain why. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, you have to have an audience. Right. It's not a matter of quality. It's it's entirely based off of you need an audience. Right. You can make a Patreon. Like, there's obviously nothing I can do to stop you. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that you shouldn't ever do one. I'm saying right now, you shouldn't do one. Gotcha. Okay? Yeah. And so, so the reasoning behind this is because when people think about um, 
when people think about uh, what you call it, um, Patreon, you know, they're just trying to like see if they can find a way to make a living, um, right. doing whatever. And it's like the the reason why people have a hard time. Um, hold on. Yeah, the reason why people have a hard time doing Patreons is because there's nobody, there's nobody that they could um, like sell to, right? Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now if you think of it in that terms, right? Why does why does that make sense? Well, it's because it's really simple. Sorry, I was just looking at something. I was distracted for a second. Um, so this this is this is your work. It's the same concept that I talk about when it comes to getting jobs. So this is your artwork. And right now you only have an Instagram and the road is a one lane road that's only good for mini cars. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you, then you make a Patreon, which is just an extension of this bubble. So let's put that there. Right? The same thing is still gonna be true. If you have like two to three people showing up to your Instagram or like whatever, or you only have like a few hundred followers, right? Um, a small percentage of those people are gonna actually buy, like if, if any, right? right? So let's let's say 5%. So if you do 5%, you're gonna get like five people to buy your $5 thingy. So like $25, you know? Right. And honestly, you won't even get that for 100 people. You'd be lucky if you even got like, too, and they're probably gonna be your friends, people that you know. Okay. Right. You might get more than that if you have a lot of really helpful and supportive people in your life, but those are the only people. You're not looking to get, you know, five dollars from your friends. You're looking to get five dollars from your fan base. You know. Right. So you build your Instagram following. You get a thousand people. Now, should I do an AJ? Nope. Because the same thing's gonna happen. It's still gonna be a small percentage. And now it's starting to get closer to what actually might happen. You may only get 5%, uh, or like the five people from this. I mean, not the 5%, sorry. Five people will probably only show up for this. So it's 0.5%, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and you're like, what? Because I get the logic, right? You think a thousand people, dude, a thousand, if all 1,000 of those people give me five bucks, dude, that's 5K, dude. Tight. Right, but obviously not everybody's going to be giving money. Yeah, not everybody. And in fact, the majority of people will not. So when do you actually start to think that this is something of value? When you start to get into 10,000? Yeah, you can go ahead and build it there. But are you going to get the 1,000 from that? Because what is that? That's, that's 10%, isn't it? I don't know. That's... Uh, that's 1%. No, no that's 100,000 I'm thinking. Yeah, that's 10%, right? That's still a very small margin. Even if we said 5%, right? It's like 500 people. Even if we said uh, 0.25% or like 2.5%. Uh, so it's 20, 250 people, right? And if we do the math, what is this? Why can't I do this in my head? It's 1250, right? Oh, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You're like, that's still really good chump change to have every month, potentially. You know? Yeah, for sure. But that still but, is not going to happen. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. You're still not going to get the... 250 people. Maybe yeah. now you'll probably get 25 people. <laughs> it's like 0.25%. Okay. Right. And that's, you know, that's if like I'm releasing content, that's exclusive to Patreon. Yeah. yeah. And so they're like, what the, why is it so small? It's just because people don't engage. So then what, what should happen? What about a hundred thousand? Now we're talking. Now we're pro probably gonna get like a hundred people, maybe a hundred to 250 people. Now we're able to get between a thousand bucks uh, or sorry, 500 bucks to 
1,250. Wait, I feel like I'm doing the math wrong still. <laughs> anyway, let's just assume this math is right. Between five to $1,000 is probably more accurate, actually. Okay? 500 to $1,000 with 100,000 followers. Okay? And that is if you're, like, really engaged with your following, right? Like, if I were to make a Patreon, this would probably be very accurate for me. I could see that happening. Yeah. Okay. But the question is now, is Patreon worth doing that, right? And the answer for me is not yet. Not when yet. I get to 250,000, which will probably happen sometime next year, if not 2022, right? Mm -hmm. Then I'll start a Patreon and I'll be making easily 1,500 or a Patreon like type thing to right. $2,500 a month for like an easy $5 to $10 to your system. Cause there's gonna yeah. be people that are gonna spend this and this, and then obviously I can have like a dollar tier, right? Okay. But you see, that's a lot of people. And this is for Instagram. This isn't necessarily true for every other platform. So let's go to right. ArtStation. ArtStation is completely different. If you were to have 10,000 followers on Instagram and made a tutorial, let's say, Mm -hmm. that that is going to be somewhere along these lines already you're already going to be able to make like 500 bucks from your tutorials five uh five hundred thousand dollars a month from your tutorials if you have really good content and if you have ten thousand uh clear fans of your work right right but even then i would say wait till like you get to like closer to like 20 or even thirty thousand. Because the number of people is not reflective of how many people will engage. And this is very, very important. When we did the New York event that we, I went to, that I moved the class for, my buddy was already like, oh, I'm going to send it to everybody. We're going to be able to. And I was like, no, 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 hold on. Because he has like hundreds of thousands of followers here, 50,000 there, 20,000 here. He's like 10,000 people on his uh, freaking Discord, you know? He's like, there's no way yeah. we're not going to sell this out, you know? And I was like, look, I don't think that we're not going to sell. I think we are. But I don't think it's going to sell out as fast as you may think. And so we did a mailing list. The mailing list got up to 80 people after sending it to all of those websites, Instagram, everything, all with the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Right. First of all, not everybody lives in New York or in the East Coast. So that's going to like probably cut that margin down to like 10% of the people who actually are our followers. So we went from hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands. Right? Yep. And then within those people, there's there's going to be even a smaller margin of people that are willing to spend $50. Right. Yeah. And even within those people, uh, those people might not even be artists like non artists because believe it or not, people who follow us, not all of them are artists or care to be artists. They may right. just genuinely look at our artwork and be like, this is cool. This person's fucking cool. That's it. Just like you probably follow like musicians and, um, uh, other people that of different industries, right? Yep. I, I once followed uh, like a porn star, for instance, but I have no interest of going to a porn convention, seeing this person talk about porn. <laughs> you know, like that's <laughs> yeah, never right. that's never going to be on my mind. Um, I actually wanted to go to the, the porn awards. I heard somebody talk about it. And I was like, that sounds like it was a lot of fun. But even I guess then, that is a thing, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. It sounds like it actually sounds really cool, and I was just like, it's actually like, re like the awards that they give out like are really funny. Like they're like the best anal, like penetration award goes to, <laughs> and I'm like, I think I would just want to be there because it sounds hilarious. Um, yeah, for sure. In in a way where they're not laughing at each other, they're laughing with each other, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And that sounds like my kind of event. <laughs> right. But you see my point is that the, the numbers aren't reflective of like, you're, you're, you don't understand your audience if you think this is true, if you think it's like one for one, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely not the case. So if you only have like, like I said, 200 people, which is a lot of people still, even if you said all 200 people gave you $5, right? Yeah. That, that's a thousand bucks, dude, it's tight, <laughs> you know? But, but the reality is maybe 10 of them would be willing to give you five bucks. And even out of those 10 people, only three of them will, <laughs> you, know? you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so when you look at like your portfolio or whatever your brand is, you wanna build not just one road, you wanna build like mega highways from all over the place, from DeviantArt, ArtStation, 
and you want like them to be large roads, like where there's some of them are larger than others. This is why I do lots of events. This is why I do lots of talks. This is why I started doing YouTube again. You know, start build, building this this brand, this audience, this web, this network. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. And once you start to collectively have somewhere, and again, depending on your website, like if you go to like art focused website, like ArtStation, DeviantArt, then the numbers don't have to be as high. Okay. Right. And that's assuming like, that I'm offering something that another artist on Patreon isn't. No, I don't even think of it that way. Like, like you built that audience, they might want what you have. Okay. Don't think of it like, oh, well, someone else is doing exactly the same thing as I'm doing. No, not exactly. Right. Right. So like you, you, yeah, you're going to probably have something different to offer. And even think of it from your perspective as a consumer, do you only consume from one person? Like I will only look at all things that Anthony Jones does. No, every time like a modern James, modern day James video pops up, I just delete it. I report <laughs> it to YouTube because I don't want to watch anything but AJ. This stuff. isn't Anthony Jones. What's wrong? Yeah. Oh, Feng Zhu, what is this block? <laughs> you know, like, no, right? Do you yeah. only buy my tutorials? Of course you don't. I'm sure you buy many other tutorials from other people, right? Yeah. Like, so think of it as a, even from a consumer's point of view, like, are you as a consumer even think this way of like only consuming one person's videos? I mean, even no. get like specific, like, do you only watch one person's character design video? Like for concept art, it's very, very specific, very, very niche. And yet the answer is still no, right? Like, of course right. you look at all sorts, right? Like there's, if someone like a, uh, Bjorn Huri like did like uh, his own character design videos. You'd probably buy them. I would probably buy them. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? Because I like his, I like how he paints and I like his design sense. I, I would learn something, you know? Yeah. It's not like you only consume one person's content and this is the end of times. You've, you've learned everything you needed to learn. That's not how excellence is made. Excellence is, is, is the average of all the people that you think are excellent. That's how you become you. You're just an average of who all the people that influence you are, you know? Gotcha. And so, so even this like thinking of, well, there's competition, like, yes, but people consume all their competition. Like right. my friend was like, oh man, when Disney plus comes out, it's going to destroy Netflix. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah. we, we, what are you getting at? Like Netflix is fucking dope. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, you know, I can have both Netflix and Disney Plus, you yeah. didn't realize this, right? Yeah. And then he was like, Disney oh, only shit, has right. the properties that Disney has. So. Yeah, and he and he he got the Disney Hulu ESPN package. He got the one where it's like all three of the things, and he still has Netflix. And I was like, yeah, it's essentially what someone made the prediction of like, it's going to be more like what the old cable networks were. Yeah, where where you would pay for like the seventy or eighty dollar package a month, but you would have like all these different channels. You basically do the same. Like you probably spend like uh, fifty to sixty dollars a month, but you would have like Netflix, you would have Hulu, you would have HBO, and then now you would have Disney Plus, right? Yep. And then, and if you really don't like watch one more than the other, then you just won't get them. Like I don't really watch Hulu that often, uh, or ESPN. So I just got the basic package because I don't really care for the other two, you know? Yep. And um. And I already have an Amazon Prime account for Amazon stuff. So I already just have Amazon stuff, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, unless there's like another streaming service, then maybe then I'll start to consider which ones I'm going to drop. But the last one that's probably going to go is fucking Netflix. Dude. Netflix yeah. has already built a strong, they have, if they have the League of Legends model where they had no competition for nearly a, very a decade. Long time. Yeah. yeah and so they've really cemented themselves and they they are more than capable to adjust when they need to and so yep so anyway that's kind of how i think about that okay thank you yeah makes sense yeah all right cool yeah because again like i think a lot of people get this idea of like oh should i do a patreon because on on the paper it looks tight but you got to be smart about it and here's the thing if you built a Patreon, it's not like it would be a bad uh, like idea to build your audience starting from like a Patreon. It's just the problem of sustainability because if you're not getting paid a lot, 
because if you have like 15 people but you only like because it makes sense if you have like 100 people paying you five bucks because then if you spend like a day on a painting it's technically like you got paid 500 dollars for that painting that's right. good that's good money you know uh if you get paid like 1500 dollars a month yeah it's like about three to four hundred dollars a painting if you do one every month or every week so that's completely reasonable but if you have to have that same work ethic but you only are catering to four people <laughs> you know yeah it's like what what's the point yeah then you you are more likely to just stop doing it and canceling it and destroying your patreon anyway right which will harm your audience or your brand no it's it wouldn't not no? at the scale no like that's just okay. too small of a scale and most people sense. most people will be okay with it but like okay. i mean they won't be happy but like it's like it's really very few people that you have to deal with um, right you're at least burning very few bridges i would say if you had like a hundred people that's where you would start to it'll start to become a little bit problematic um yeah so you want to like be assured when you start you have to start with like a good good amount of people all right so that way the incentive is there does gotcha. that make sense yep i know a few people who started with very few people following them but they they had like a plan of action so that it didn't matter um because they were building their youtube alongside their patreon uh, right. that was my buddy ross uh, uh, ross tran yep so he started really small um but he did a patreon he had a youtube channel he had all this stuff like all these things like moving all at once and then he just did it makes sense he just started to just do it yep and it was it was really cool it worked out great well, that's awesome but yeah I'll definitely wait on that <laughs> yeah you my advice is just to wait I, I don't think you should do one until you really feel like you have a good audience and you have to you have to also remember who is your audience like if you're building an audience around the specific type of art style you don't educate them you don't do any educational content then don't do tutorials and stuff right or if you do do very few of them um, but if you build an audience around like just your artwork maybe you would build it on um, just getting access to your paintings and maybe um, having high resolution versions of it you might think well that's like no value like no like if you're if you're uploading like a half resolution images on your instagram and all that stuff but you like have like these freaking massive images that people have access to that they can use for prints yeah and print it out and put it on their walls and stuff like this that that might have that might be worth five dollars a month you know what i mean yeah for me like if i felt like yeah i'd love to have that image you know yeah it makes sense anyway cool beans cool beans any other questions i'll let you guys go Yo. What's up, buddy? Yeah, man. Uh, I was wondering, like, I, I don't have too much time to, to stay in the class. I have to leave, like, in half an hour or eight, maybe even less than that. But anyways, uh, I don't really, I'm not really sure if I'm allowed to ask this, but let's go for <laughs> it anyways. What? <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not really a question. It's more like a, a, an overview about some stuff. I was wondering if you could like take a look at the stuff that I do already that is in my portfolio and kind of, uh, I don't know, like, because I, I, we talked about like the companies that we wanted to be working for uh -huh. and right now I can only think about Japanese companies and, and I'm like, man, come on, it's reasonable, but not yet, you know? So uh, do you know any studios that kind of do stuff that is that is more that is similar to to those japanese companies that i mentioned like i mean you kind of understand that because you also want to work with the, with uh from software right like who are the guys that are doing uh there's a lot of them in america like netties and like um uh there's there's one that's not in america the but a44 they're pretty good but there's like a lot of places i just don't know their all their names <laughs> on the top of my head but there are actually more and some big studios you know like i mean now blizzard's technically doing it with mm -hmm. diablo 4 you know yeah yeah that's which, which, that's one thing which <laughs> i wish uh, i would have known i would have never left <laughs> <You know? laughs> um but you know 
the the point of like picking a studio is not so you can get work at that studio um entirely it's supposed to build a portfolio that other studios that would want that like studio adjacent they would see what you do and then they would hire you like you gotta also recognize there's studios out there that are lurk, look lurking around on the art station and deviant art and stuff and if they mm-hmm. find a portfolio that suits that need then they're going to hire you and the reason why it's powerful to just stay focused is it makes you better quicker too you know mm-hmm and so, um, uh, I'm sure your portfolio is pretty good. I mean, if you want to share it, I can take a quick glance at it. Okay. Okay. Let's go for it. It's yeah. Let's do so it. you can kind of, you can kind of see like what I was doing with compared with, with what I am doing right now. And so we have a better, it's there in the chat. Okay. The chat. I see it. Give me a second. Oh yeah, Bing, follow, dude. I think I've actually seen some of the stuff before. Yeah, I think you're actually already capable of work, even like before I saw what you've done recently, especially the last stuff. This is tight. I like this. Oh, it's super tight. Environment stuff's good. It's pretty standard though. <laughs> it's like very typical. This is pretty dope. Yeah, so I kind of like this, man. I like that one a lot. <clears throat> yeah, so the stuff that you did for the class is good. <clears throat> it should be posted here almost instantly. But here's the here's the problem. Is you're not posting enough often. Yeah, like like you got some of these right. images, yeah, some of these images have like year literally years between them. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Like we have this image that was done 2 years ago. Or at least it was posted two years ago. I don't know if it was done two years ago. Maybe it was done later. It was posted like, uh, it was done like in the same time. Okay. Yeah, but it's irrelevant of when, when and how it was done. The, the point is, is that you're not posting enough. So that was two years ago. And then this was a year ago. So it's technically a year till you posted again. Okay. And then if we go here, um, this looks like it might've been posted within the same time frame. So you got two images that are posted in a year, and then half a year later, you post another image, okay? Yeah. And so now it's been six months, and you have yet to post another image. So the (laughs) shortest amount of time of posting images, I mean, I'm sure like most of these were all posted all at the same time, Mm -hmm. but then you just stop posting, and then you post it, then you stop posting, and then you post it. So your average rate of posting is about like a year, it seems like, (laughs) okay? Something like that, yeah. One image a year is not going to help you, my man, is what I'm getting at, okay? So, like, for me, I, I've been taking a break of posting periodically because I've been working a lot. So, 10 days, that's, like, a long time for me, man. Not on my Instagram, though. I've been posting quite often on Instagram. But, mm-hmm. like, 12 days, so it's usually my average is every other day. But for the last uh, few months, uh, or at least the last month or so, I've been working a lot. So, I've been only posting pretty much – my average now is around like a one post every week on art station. Instagram is different, but there was times where I'm just like posting literally every day. And I did this actually, if I had like a YouTube video about it and I was talking about like building your audience, just post a lot. And I did. And I showed how, and I think I gained like 6,000 new followers in that 30 day span. And I showed like how it was very correlated, but my average of posting is pretty, pretty uh, like often is what I'm getting at. And there's no secret to why I do well is what I'm getting at. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once you start to realize that, 
then you start to realize, oh, I should postpone. And yeah. getting to your point about like, well, you know, like this is how I learned, this is whatever. Uh, I'm telling you, do that one hour sketch shit, man, because you might find that you've been <laughs> slowing yourself down for no real reason, right? Like I believe that there's things that are in your way of your process that's slowing you down. But think about it. In the span of a week, you've done so, or sorry, span of a month, you've done so many drawings and you have four characters to show for it. Yeah. So there's no doubt in my mind you can do at least one character post a week. A week. That's no what doubt. I do. <laughs> no, yeah, no doubt in my mind. Um, but I would even push you to try to do two a week, right? Mm -hmm. One in the middle of the week, maybe like Wednesday, and then one in the on the weekend or something like Saturday, and then just keep doing it, right? And you will be surprised how quickly people will start to respond to you. I mean, you won't be too surprised. I'm telling you that this is how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you will be surprised at how stubborn you were before. Like, why didn't you look into this sooner? Uh, almost yeah. like, it's like a high percentage rate of students that I have that I feel are already really good, like you, that start to do this, that start to get work. Okay? You're not on the radar. That's why nobody's giving you as much work as you'd like. Yeah. The other people who are posting more often than you, they're the ones that are constantly on the radar. And it doesn't mean that they are taking all your jobs because they can only do one job <laughs> at a time. Mm. Right? And so the way that uh, you, you think about it is like this. It's like imagine, imagine this is, oh, I'm so stupid. There you go. There you go, there you go. Like this is an image, you post it, this is your image. And this is not your image, this is somebody else's image, right? So you post your image and it's like a feed, right? It goes up, up, and then now I don't see your image anymore. And if I don't see your image for like another, <laughs> Like year, Another year right? <laughs> I'm going to see all these other people's images that are not you. See, that's how I do well is that my, one of my images is usually on the front page of ArtStation, not because it's necessarily good. I mean, it is good. I do good work, right? But not because it's the best, but because it's there always. Yeah. You know, I'm always posting and that's why. Uh, there's people that are clearly, clearly better than me. You know, I follow these people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I don't see them post nearly as much as me. And it's funny, as soon as I made that video and I put even a gum round out about it too, like to be more specific on how to do this, right? Like to know your audience. Literally like a year this later. Yeah, literally like a year later, like all these people that were not doing as well as me, started like just posting all the time and now they're fucking destroyed me. They're like in the 70s, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're like really wrecking house. And I'm like, wow, what the, and so the, it's, they're taking literally my advice. And the reason why it's working really well for them because they're way better than me, but I am still faster than them. I can still beat them <laughs> in terms of posting rate. Yeah. yeah. And uh, an art station just, has done, done a thing that I really like, which is they remove the likes so you can't see what people's um, followers or likes are um, on the front of their page. Only, yeah. I, only I can see it. Like you can see how many followers somebody has, I believe. Right, but you can't see how many likes, how many page visits, uh, other than on the images themselves. Right, but I, liked, I used to like to show this statistic to my fans and to my students because it was really helpful for them to understand um because this person would have fourteen thousand followers and then they would have thousands of likes on per image for good reason this guy's great okay yeah i dig his work too it's pretty dope yeah so thousands of likes per image where i only get a couple hundred you know Let me That's see if it. I can find, like, so this is a pretty good image that I've done, right? So, like, look, I got, like, 500 likes, 3,000 views. And then this person's got 
1,500 likes and 14,000 views. So way more than me, right? And there's almost a correlation there. For, for every 5,000 views, you get 500 likes, it seems like, for him. And then for me, for every 3,000, 4,000 views, I get 500 likes. So there's like, um, there's a correlation there. But, but that's not the point I'm making. So like on the surface, it looks like I don't get nearly as much traction but then when we look at like the global likes, like how many likes I have just in the global sense, I like would beat out almost everybody, even people that had way more followers than me. Yeah. Because I have so many images that all those images collectively add up to lots and lots and lots and lots of likes. And lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of views. You know? And that's really what it comes down to is those views. Like how many people are actually visiting my site? And I remember there was somebody had like 50,000 uh, followers or something. I only had like 40,000 at the time. So we had 10,000 more. But then I had like double his views. Yeah. Like, do you think this is true for uh, just freelance work or is yeah, it true for? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for everything. Jobs? For everything. Full time right? jobs, for freelance work, for uh, selling your own stuff, building like you are just always on the radar, whether it's a client mm -hmm. finding you or whether it's other fans following you, wanting to learn from you, or whether it's people that want to hire you for a full-time job. Yeah. My friend, he was saying the same shit to me. He's a really good artist. And I was like, like, just post, man. You don't post anything. The last thing you posted was literally two years ago. Same thing like you, right? And he's like, all right. So he like just did like this whole dump of artwork. And then he got literally a week later a job from Amazon. <laughs> And he was like, he was like, he was telling me he was crazy. He just like shared it, and then like a week later, and then he shared some stuff recently, and then he got a, again approached, <laughs> you know, and because he's really good. And I'm like, yeah, dude, like people are looking, dude, they're scouring the internet for awesome art, you know. Dude, I love this one. This one's so dope. I don't know if this person's using Surface Painter. Yeah, I gotta like go Surface back Painter. Back. I used to post a lot more when I was just starting out, but you know, things happened and just got myself into a little cocoon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't like practice and have time where you're just focused, <laughs> okay? I'm just saying this is why you don't have as much opportunities as you like. And if you don't like that conclusion, then you gotta change the reaction. Right? Of course. So if you want to have more opportunities, then you got to like present yourself more often. It's really that simple, my man. It's really not that crazy. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, thank you again for the opportunity for doing like so many characters in like such a short amount of time because it's just like, like you said, like we produce like a lot of work in less than one month and we're going to do like a lot more now. Yeah. And you, you, it's gonna be you're, totally yeah, you're more in your head than you, like, you're your own worst enemy, my man. You're more capable than you realize. Okay. I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Well, then listen to people, man. <laughs> Stop being so stubborn. Yeah. Thanks, man. Absolutely. Really, really. It's been a crazy time. I'm glad to hear that, man. I gotta go now, because... I because think I'm we all have to go. I have to get going, too. Yeah. But, all right. All right, guys, I'm going to let you guys go. Have a great weekend. Have a great holiday. Too. Great holidays. Yeah, have a Happy good New Christmas. Year. We're going to see New each other uh, 1st of January, right? Yeah, you guys are going to be the first students I talked to at the beginning of the year. Yeah, such an honor, <laughs> really. Absolutely. All right, guys, we'll talk to you guys later. Enjoy your vacations and cheers. I think it's just you and Zach, actually. I think everyone <laughs> else left. Cheers, friends. Peace yeah, out. Yeah, man, cheers. See ya. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.